All right, now in Hebrews chapter 5, I'm going to be focusing in on the first part of the chapter there. And um, really, what, what, I'm, what I'm teaching about tonight, what I'm preaching tonight, is, is a doctrine. And it's how things ought to be run in the church, but more specifically, churches ought to have pastors who are ordained. There's a lot of people, again, in these days, there's a, there's a great apostasy. There's a lot of, of, of uh, churches that have fallen away and, and are, are not teaching you know, very biblical truths. They've gotten really watered down. And again, the advent of the internet is, is interesting. It's, it's, it proposes some unique problems and some special cases that um, have never been around before. But, we, you know, the Bible doesn't need to reference the internet in order to know what's right and what's wrong. We still have a template. We still have a blueprint for doing things. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 40, the Bible says, Let all things be done decently and in order. And this is talking about within the church. God has structured the church. God has a structure and, and a design for it. And He has ordained pastors and deacons Right? You call him a pastor, you call him a bishop, you could call him an elder. Right? It's all the same position within the church. And he's also ordained deacons within a church. And these are the offices that, that are to be filled within a church. And there's very specific rules on who can fill those and how they get filled. Now, unfortunately today, we have, I, I'm seeing more and more people taking it upon themselves to say, well, I am going to start a church and just starting it. Not getting sent out, not getting ordained, not having hands laid on them, not having any of that. And violating scripture and going out and just saying, well, I'm just going to start a church. And I'm going to prove to you tonight that the Bible, the God's way of doing things. Now look, you can thumb your nose at God's way of doing things. And these people, I'm sure, can go out and get people saved. Right? I mean, they can still preach the gospel. They can still do those things. But the problem is, do you want to do things right or not? Do you want to do things God's way and the way that the Bible lays out? Or are you just going to take it upon yourself as Saul did? If you remember, you remember Saul back when, um, kind of in the, early on in his, in his being a, a king over Israel, he was going out to war and, and, and fighting some battles against the Philistines. And he was winning some battles. And then there was one battle in particular where, you know, they were all surrounded. And they were outnumbered. And the people started to get afraid. And they started to leave him, right? And he's starting to get really nervous and really, you know, scared that uh, Samuel hadn't shown up when he said he was going to. Samuel was the, was the prophet at the time. He was the last judge before Saul became a king when the people said, no, we want to have a king and, and that whole story. But um, Samuel was supposed to, to arrive and, and offer up the sacrifice and inquire of the Lord and things like that before they went out to battle. So they're waiting for Samuel to show up. Samuel didn't get there exactly when he was supposed to have gotten there. So Saul decided to take it upon himself to offer up a sacrifice unto the Lord. And, you know, he did this. Now, look, it, it was in God's law and, in, in, you know, in the books of Moses that it was established that the priest was supposed to perform those sacrifices. It was for the tribe of Levi that were given those offices to do those sacrifices. Saul was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was not a Levite. He had no authority to do those things. He was not appointed to do those things. But he thought, hey, I'm the king. Samuel's not here. This needs to be done. We need to do what's right for God. And again, good intentions of well, this is for the Lord. This needs to be done before we can go out and fight. We need to offer up a sacrifice or an offering unto God. But he was wrong because he shouldn't have been doing those things. And Samuel rebukes him when he shows up. He's like, what are you doing? You know, because of course, as soon as Saul does that, he takes matters in his own hand, he offers up the, the sacrifice. As soon as he's done with that, basically Samuel shows up. It's like, if you would have just waited a little bit longer, everything would have been just fine. But, you know, Saul, that's one of the reasons why God took the kingdom away from him because he wasn't obeying God's commandments. He was just throwing them aside, 
thinking, well, this needs to be done. We're in dire need. You know, this is a great need. Someone needs to do this, so I'm going to step in and fill that position. And it's the same thing that could be applied to people today who say, well, we're in a dire need. There's all these churches that are apostate. Someone needs to just start this church, so I'm just going to pick myself up, and I'm going to ordain myself as an elder, and I'm going to start this church and do this. And that is not the way that God has it spelled out in the Bible. Look at Hebrews chapter 5 where we started reading. Look at verse number 1. Now, mind you, and I know this, this is talking about the priests in the Old Testament. Okay? And as New Testament believers, you know, the Bible says that he's made all of us priests and kings and what have you. But oftentimes you can take the priests in their office and their position of what they were doing and serving the Lord and make a parallel to the New Testament with the um, you know, with pastors and bishops and deacons and things like that. So let's just look at this because the Bible says in verse 1, for every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. That word ordained, it means, it means kind of a few things, but generally it's you're, you're chosen or you are, um, you know, like anointed, ordained, um, set apart, you know, you, you are... Chosen's a pretty good word for that, for this position, or anointed for this position, okay? It's something that's decided that you are not doing to yourself. You are ordained of somebody else, okay? And the Bible says every high priest that's taken from among men, they are ordained. And they're ordained for men and things pertaining to God. Verse 2, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And, you know, you can apply these things, not the, not the, the um, sacrifices for sins, but, you know, a pastor should be someone who has compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself is compassed with infirmity. Verse number three, and by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer for sins. Look at verse number four. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. Okay, Aaron didn't decide, hey, I'm going to be the high priest. That was given to him by God. He was ordained by God that, no, Aaron is appointed the high priest. He was called of God and, and set in that position. He didn't take that upon himself. That's why it says, no man taketh this honor unto himself. Verse number five, so also Christ glorified not himself to be made in high priest, but he that said unto him, thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. So even Jesus Christ himself didn't come and just proclaim himself to be that high priest. God, the father had ordained him to be that high priest and had chosen him and had exalted him by saying, you know, thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. When he said that unto him, that's, that's him putting him in that position of the high priest. As he saith also in another place, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So Hebrews 5, it's pretty clear. It's saying, look, you don't take this position upon yourself. No one takes his honor unto himself. It's something that's given to you. Let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3 gives us a breakdown of the requirements for a, for a bishop for a pastor, for an elder of a church. And we're going to look at these tonight and, um, and see what the Bible explains is required in a pastor. Look at verse number 1 of 1 Timothy chapter 3. The Bible says, This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. So basically, first verse, it's a good thing. If you want to become a bishop, if you want to be a pastor of a church, hey, that's a good thing. You desire a good work. But no, it also calls it the office because there is a specific office. It is, it is a position. It's a job that you have. It's not just like anybody from the congregation is getting up and being the pastor for a day. No, you're holding an office within the church. There is a definite structure to the church that God has ordained. Now, we don't go and just make extra structure to the church that doesn't exist in the Bible, but at the same time, we don't dismiss this office either because it's specifically talked about. Look at verse number two, a bishop then. So he's going into the rules. I'll say, okay, you want to be a, a bishop? Great. That's a good thing. It's a good work that you want to do. Verse number two, a bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, 
of good behavior given to hospitality, apt to teach, lots of good qualities that you need to possess in order to be a pastor, in order to be a bishop. You need to be you know, married to one wife. You need to be vigilant and, and stay on top of things. You need to be sober, which means serious and also not given alcohol and things like that, which we're going to see in a little bit. Of good behavior, people aren't just, you know, you have a bad rep of, of causing trouble and, you know, whatever, just being kind of rebellious or whatever. Given to hospitality, being, you know, being able to, to provide hospitality with people when they come and being apt to teach, being able to instruct other people in, in order to teach the Bible and teach God's word. You need to be able to have that aptitude or that ability in order to teach, in order to break things down and make it easy to be understood by the people. Um, verse number three, not given to wine. So you're not a drunkard. You're not, you're not just given to, to drink and wine or uh, it says no striker. You're not getting in fights and, and um, you know, someone gets you upset and you, you know, you're just going to hit them. I mean, there's some, there's some men that are like that. He's saying you can't be like that if you want to be a bishop. Not greedy of filthy lucre. You can't be motivated by money just to, you know, this is going to prevent you from having a, a pastor that's, that's in it just for the money. That's going to tone down his, down his preaching because he's focused on making money more than, you know, helping people and actually preaching the truth of God's word. Um, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. One that ruleth well his own house having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Now this explains something that's pretty important for a pastor as well. He's saying, look, one of the requirements is that he needs to rule his own house well. Because your household is going to be a lot smaller than a congregation, than a, than a church. So if you can't even keep your children under control and keep your wife under control and be able to run your household in a, in a godly way and in, in a good way where your children listen to you, they're obeying you, they're following you. Because look, as the head of a household, you're a leader. And you're not a very good leader if nobody's listening to what you say. If you tell your kids to do something, they just go do something else. You tell your wife to do something, yeah, she just forgets you, just yeah, whatever. That's not a very good leader, and that's not someone that you want to say, okay, well, let's just make this person a pastor. Now, that person may be a good man. They might know a lot of Bible and things like that, but they're not leading their house well. They're not ruling their house well. And in order to be a bishop of a church, in a way, it's a ruling the church and, and you know, organizing and, and being a leader so that people can follow you. And, and you're doing the works, and they're going to want to follow you because you have that ability to be a good leader. And he's saying, look, if you can't do that well within your own house, then you also are not qualified to hold this position then within the church. And look at verse number six is key. It says, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. So what's a novice? A novice is like a beginner. Okay, not someone who's new to this, not someone who, you know, you just got saved and you, you know, like, you just made it through the Bible from cover to cover for the first time, and now all of a sudden, hey, this guy's got a good heart. He wants to serve the Lord. Let's just make him a pastor. No. You need to have experience. You need to be tried and true. And that's why you know, all these different things are all qualities that someone should have. That's, you don't just look at someone for like a week and say, oh, yeah, this person's qualified. You need to, to kind of give it some time to see if all of these qualities this person possesses or you know, abstains from, depending on the nature of the, of the quality, if it's a good one or a bad one, um, it's something that needs to be determined over time. And not enough, I'm going to get to that in a, in a little bit. We'll keep reading here. Verse number seven says, Moreover, he must have a good report of them that which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So you got to have, have a pretty good reputation. You can't just be, you know, um, having this, this bad report of all these other people just all saying bad things about you because you, you know, whatever, you've wronged people and everything else. Now look, we're not all, you know, we're all sinners, but not everyone has just this horrible reputation of a person that's real shady and, and is, you know, and deceiving people and things like that. We need to have a good report in order to be able to, to, to hold the position. Verse number eight, likewise must the deacons be grave. So now he starts going into the, the qualifications for a deacon not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre. And we see a lot of similarities here between the, the, the bishop and the deacon. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved. Now look, it says, 
we're talking about the qualifications of a deacon, but it says, and let these also first be proved. So if it's saying, let these also, he's saying, in addition to what we were just talking about, which was the bishops, right? So the bishop first needs to be proved as well as the deacon. Both of them need to first be proved. They need to be tested. They need to be watched that they are, you know, um, qualified. So let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. And again, I want to point out the wording, let them. Who's letting them? Who's going to let them use the office of a deacon? Well, the church, right? Or, or in this case, it's actually Timothy, right? He's, saying, he's, he's writing this specifically to Timothy. Then let them use, so he's talking about these, you know, the, the pastors that once they're approved, or the deacons, once they're approved, let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless, right? So Timothy is the one who's saying, okay, he can allow them to hold that office, Verse number 11, even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So he's saying, again, you know, this is a great chapter that, that explains, this is how you run things. This is how a church is run. This is how I want it set up. These are the offices. This is how you choose and determine who is going to be a bishop and who is going to be a deacon. These are the qualifications you need to look for. And it's written unto Timothy, who was himself an elder. He was a bishop. Okay, he was a pastor of a church, and Paul is giving him this instruction that this is how you choose these people. Now, does it look like these requirements, after we read them, that something is, is designed for you to just look at yourself and then determine, hey, look, I'm qualified, and then just go out and start your own church? No, not at all. This is something that's laid out that other people are looking at your behavior. Other people are seeing, hey, is this, is this guy getting into fights easily? Hey, does this guy know how to rule his own house? It's easy for a person to just say within themselves, oh yeah, I, you know, I, I, I'm the head of my household and they think like uh, they're doing such a great job. Other people are like, nobody's listening to you. You know, but they're just blind to that or whatever. Or how about this? How, how do you know, how does the novice know that they're not a novice. You know what I mean? A lot of times, and I've seen this so many times, people who think they know so much about the Bible, and again, usually it's younger Christians because they start learning a lot real fast. And then they compare themselves to other people that maybe aren't even saved or that are in like super watered down liberal churches that, that get no teaching at all so that they're comparing themselves to essentially babes in Christ that themselves don't know much, so they start to get lifted up and thinking that, wow, I know so much. These same people know not very much, and they don't even realize it. They're novices. And, and again, over the years, I've seen this so many times. And the, the people, and it's interesting because it says, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Now, not everybody gets like this. Not every novice gets prideful and haughty, but I've seen it in some people. And this is what it's warning against. But those people, these very people, if they were to think about themselves, would not at all think, I'm a novice. Because they've already gotten themselves proud and lifted up and haughty in their heart and don't even realize it. They think they know so much. And this is, and this is why you have somebody else appointing the elders, appointing the bishops, and appointing the deacons. Someone else is, from the outside is looking at people and analyzing them and saying, yes, this person is qualified, or no, this person is not qualified. Look, if you would, at Titus chapter 1. It's another similar passage to 1 Timothy 3. We're going to look at Titus 1. Titus is another pastor of a church. He was another preacher. 
And this is again the Apostle Paul writing to Titus. Chapter 1, look at verse number 4. He says, To Titus, mine own son after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. Look at this, verse 5. For this cause left I thee in Crete. I left you in Crete for this reason, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting. Wanting means lacking. And ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. So here we see a chain of grant. We see Paul has appointed Titus to do this job, to do this work. And the, the, the job that Titus was given was to ordain elders in every city. So he's saying, look, you need to set up people who are going to be the elders. They're going to be the pastors in these various cities, in these various churches. You need to establish them. You need to set them up. These other churches aren't just, you know, it's not just like someone's just saying, I'm going to pastor a church. We see here Titus's job was to ordain the elder for those churches. He's saying, you need to ordain them. You need to pick them out. These are the qualities, and he gives them the qualifications. Look at verse 6. It continues on there. So he gives them this job. He says, verse 6, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doc doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. People that, that are appointed to a position of an elder need to have been taught themselves. They are taught by someone else who is a mature Christian, someone else who knows the Bible, someone else who's able to teach them things because they were younger in faith. Look, everything that we know, everything we learn has been taught to us. Now, either through preaching and through a preacher or from the Holy Bible, but still, you need to be taught certain things. We need men in this position. That's why God created the position to begin with. Because we need to be taught. We need preachers. We need pastors. We need, you know, we need people in these spots in order to help us to understand and in order to help us to grow and to become grounded and founded in the faith. Now there's so much, it, it would take you so long, all completely on your own, to figure out the Bible, even being, you know, being saved. Of course, I'm, talking, I'm not talking about being unsaved. I'm talking about having the Holy Spirit inside of you. It still would take you so long to come to the knowledge of all these truths without having been taught them. We need to be taught by other people to help bring us up to speed and help us to grow more quickly. That's one of the reasons why church is so important. Because we need to be learning these things from someone who's not a babe in Christ and someone who has also been taught and, and um, knows the scripture. So he says, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Now turn if you would to, um, to Acts chapter 1. I'm going to read for you from Mark 3 because we see this ordination in choosing people. Now, we are, we are, I already seen, have presented some pretty convincing arguments from Hebrews 5, 1 Timothy 3, and Titus chapter 1 that this is the way things ought to be. But we could, you know, this is the way the New Testament things ought to be. Mark chapter 3, verse 14, talking about Jesus ordaining his disciples. The Bible says, and he ordained 12 that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. So going all the way back to Jesus' ministry, he chose out. He, he took 12 people to be his disciples and ordained them to do a certain job and to send them out to preach. How shall they preach except they be sent? That's what the Bible says in Romans chapter 10. You need someone to be sending out and giving the orders to go and do something. And here Jesus ordained these 12 so he could send them out and do what, what he was telling them to do. Um, in John 15, 16, Jesus Christ said, Ye have not chosen me, 
but I have chosen you and ordained you. So he's saying, you didn't ordain yourself to become my disciple. He says, I've chosen you. I've ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. But see, a lot of people these days, they want to ordain themselves. They, they say, you know what? There's no good churches, so I'm just going to go and do this myself. And I'm just going to start it up and, 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 you know, forget about what the Bible says. Forget about the New Testament and how, and how pastors are selected. I'm just going to take it upon myself and do this. And Jesus ordained them. They didn't ordain themselves. Look at Acts chapter 1. When we see here, you know, obviously when, when Judas was... Um, discovered as a traitor, and he went and, and killed himself. He commits suicide. He felt so bad about everything that happened. He kills himself. Well, now that leaves 11 disciples, right? And Jesus had ordained 12. So it left a position open that needed to be filled. And in Acts chapter 1, we see the story where they're trying to figure out, okay, who are we going to have to take Judas's spot? Judas isn't here anymore. But someone needs to take this job, to take this office, and look at chapter or verse 21 of, of Acts chapter 1. The Bible reads, Wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So they're, they're talking about this, they're gathered together and saying, look, okay, so someone needs to be chosen or ordained from among us that was with us all the way from the beginning, all the way through the resurrection. Like, like we need to pick someone. They had specific requirements to be an apostle, saying they needed to have been here from the beginning. Because there, are, there were other people that were with them from the beginning that weren't mentioned by name in the Bible. And Jesus chose 12 specifically to be his disciples and apostles, but there were other people that, that had gotten saved and had kind of been around and following Jesus for the duration of his ministry on the earth. And it, as is evidenced right here, because they said we need to choose someone that, uh, that was company with us. But he said they need to be ordained. Verse number 23, and they appointed two Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. Now, do we see here Matthias just stepping up and being like, well, okay, I'm going to fill this role. Hey, that, that spot needs to be filled, so I'm just going to fill it. And he just steps in and he just does it. That's not the way it works. They choose out, the, the other disciples choose out people, and they choose two. They find two people that are qualified and say, you know what? These are both really good guys. They both fit the bill. Now let's go and see who God has chosen, who God wants to fill this spot. So what they do is it says in verse 24, and they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So Matthias is the one they chose. And, you know, they gave their lots. Basically, they voted for him. They said, okay, this is who we're going to have fill that spot. And he was ordained. Now, you can say, yeah, but, you know, there's no more apostles. That was special for back then. They ordained him. I'm showing you a pattern. The reason why we went to this story is I'm pointing out that all of the offices that, were, that are given in the New Testament are offices that are filled by ordained men, by an ordination process. Okay, it's not people taking this upon themselves to go out and do it. So if you want to go out and start a New Testament church, do you really want to stick close to the Word of God and try to do everything the way the Bible outlines? Because this is, and see, this is the problem. It's, it's so hypocritical. People are complaining there's no good New Testament. You know, people aren't obeying the Bible. You know, there's these pastors. They're not preaching right. They're not doing this right. They're not doing that right. So I'm just going to go and start off and I'm going to do everything right. And from the very beginning, you start off doing it wrong. Right from the start. You want to do everything the way the Bible says, then do it the Bible way. Don't think that you're above the way that the Bible is laid out to, to start a church. 
Because there's plenty of information here on how to do it. There is a specific structure that we ought to be following. Look at Acts chapter 14. Again, the Acts of the Apostles, a great place to look for how New Testament churches are started because this is when Christianity was really booming and spreading with the Apostles going out and starting these churches and evangelizing and getting new churches started. Acts chapter 14, verse 21 reads, And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Look at this, verse 23. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. So did they leave some churches out and say, yeah, well, you guys just figure this out on your own. Someone else can just decide that they're going to be the pastor. No. It says, when they had ordained them elders in every church. Elders in every church in the New Testament, when they're going around and preaching the gospel and teaching them, because that's what they did. Look at verse 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city. So first they start off getting people saved. And then they had taught many. So now they're teaching them. They return again. They're, they're following up. They're confirming these souls. They're saying, okay, we preached here and here and here. We're getting these people saved. We're teaching them. Now we're coming back around again and checking back up on these people, exhorting them, building them up, continuing the faith, and, and explaining, you know, we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. And they ordained elders in every church. They have a congregation of believers. There's a church. They ordained the elders. They ordained the pastors. They established them as being the pastor of that church. We do not see men taking it upon themselves ever in the New Testament, just, I'm going to start this church. I'm going to do this. I mean, the Apostle Paul was sent out by Jesus Christ himself. He was ordained of God to do the job that he was doing. And we also see Ananias laying hands on him when he got saved, when he called on the name of the Lord, and, and he was sent out with Ananias laying his hands on him. For those that want to try to be an Apostle Paul and say, well, he just went out and did it on his own. No, actually, he was sent out also. Turn, if you would, to Numbers chapter 11. You know, I said the Apostle Paul was even ordained. 1 Timothy 2.7 says, Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. There he himself said that he was ordained. This is not something you take upon yourself. That's why we started off with Hebrews chapter 5. This honor, you know, you don't take this upon yourself. It's given to you. It's bestowed upon you. Someone else deems you to be worthy and sees that you fit this bill and says, okay, we're going to ordain you. We're going to lay our hands on you and we're going to send you out. And we're going to task you with a job and you're going to go do this job. Numbers chapter 11. Because this is what I've heard that people will try to use to defend their decision to go out and start these churches. Right? So they'll, they'll turn to this story in Numbers chapter 11, which reads, look at verse number 14. This is talking about Moses. Okay? So, so, so their decision to defend you know, their New Testament church, they're going to Moses and what happened here in this story. And I'm going to show you exactly why this story is not, um, there's no grounds to use this as, uh, as justification for just taking it upon yourself to start a church. But let's read the story. Verse number 14 says, I am not able to bear all this people alone because it is too heavy for me. Moses was in charge of a large multitude of people that came out of Egypt, right? There were thousands of, I mean, there, there are a lot of people that came out of Egypt that Moses was basically in charge of. He was the head of that, of that congregation, of that group of people. So he starts to get weary. And they're complaining and all the stuff going on. He has to deal with all these problems. He's saying, look, this is too much for me. Verse 15, and if thou deal thus with me, he's praying to God, kill me, I pray thee, out of hand. 
if I have found favor in thy sight, and let me not see my wretchedness. So he's at the point of like, God, just kill me. And he's like, you know what? I know, you know, like, let me not see my wretchedness. Because I, I think he probably realizes he shouldn't have this type of an attitude, but it's just, it, it's overwhelming. It's just too much. He's like, I can't do this anymore. Verse 16, And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people, and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with thee. So God hears them. He says, Okay, choose you seventy men. And he says, You choose them. Moses, choose out 70 men among the elders. The elders of the people were kind of like people who are already leaders, people who are already heads of households and, and you know, rulers within, within the, the nation of Israel, within the camp. And he says, go ahead and choose 70 of them out. So he knows these people, so he's going to pick 70 people. Jump down to verse 24. The Bible says, And Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord and gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people and set them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him and took of the spirit that was upon him and gave it unto the 70 elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. So God's spirit was resting upon Moses. That's how he was. I mean, he was being used mightily. He's preaching, preaching the word of God, leading the people, doing all kinds of good things. So God says, okay, I'm going to take some of the spirit that I've given to you. And now I'm going to, going to give the same spirit unto these other 70 people because now they'll be able to help you out. They'll be able to prophesy. They'll be able to, to, to help teach and preach and do these different things because God's given them that gift. So they rested upon them. They prophesied. They didn't cease. So really, really cool event. Hey, there's 70 other guys that are, that are kind of like Moses that are, that are speaking with the wisdom that Moses had. Verse number 26. But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad and the name of the other Medad. And the spirit rested upon them. And they were of them that were written, but went not out unto the tabernacle. And they prophesied in the camp. And there ran a young man and told Moses and it said, Eldad and Medad, do prophesy in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men answered and said, My Lord Moses, forbid them. And Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake, would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. So they'll point to this and say, See, look, Pastors that complain about someone not being sent out, they're just jealous. You know, they don't want them to do it, but God wants us to start these churches. Because they say, would God that, that all the Lord's people were prophets. Now, there's multiple reasons why that is just a completely bogus explanation or support for your argument of just taking upon yourself, besides what we've already seen in the New Testament. But let's look at this story a little bit more closely. First of all, this is one congregation. This is not, they don't have a setting of multiple local churches like we have in the New Testament. They had the tabernacle. Okay? And Moses was appointed as the head of the whole group of people. So basically what they're doing here when they're appointing 70 people, it's kind of like they're appointing 70 deacons because they're the helpers of this one congregation. First of all. Right? So if we're going to apply this at all to New Testament, the proper way that we would apply this is saying, okay, well, Moses is like the pastor. These other 70 people are helpers for Moses because it's too heavy for him. They're like the deacons. They're given a role and an office and an important office to help administer all this stuff, but it's still one church because the deacons are all part of one church where, where you have a pastor and then deacons. Now, I know you can have multiple elders or multiple pastors, and that's fine but it's still all within this same church. It's not multiple churches, people being set up to start other congregations. There was one congregation here. But not only that, the two people that prophesied, because this is, this is what the whole problem was. They were saying, well, look, these two people, they're prophesying in the camp. They didn't go to the tabernacle, but they're still prophesying. So Joshua hears that. He's like, Moses, forbid these guys. They didn't come to the tabernacle. Don't let them be, you know, be prophets. And that's where he answers, saying, well, look, do you envy for me? He said, would God that all the Lord's people were prophets. Now, would just means, you know, like, would to God. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that, well, I wish 
that all of God's people were prophets. Right? It's a good want to have because desiring the office of a bishop is a good thing. Having prophets is a good thing. And the more you can say, the merrier. Right? That's a good thing. But it, it's not at the expense of having people be a prophet that doesn't fit the bill. Right? That's not qualified. And the other thing that they're not realizing is that these two people that were prophesying that they're complaining about, they were already ordained. Because Moses had already chosen them. Look at what it says in verse number 26. It says, But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad, and the name of the other Medad. And the Spirit rested upon them, and they were of them that were written. Moses made a list. These are the men that I want to help me. These are the men that I am ordaining to be these 70 people to help me out. These 70 elders. Now, they chose not to go to the tabernacle, which they should have done. But they were already chosen. They were already ordained, which is why the Spirit was poured out them. They were of them which were written. So it's not like they weren't ordained. They were ordained by Moses. They just didn't go to the tabernacle. And then thirdly, though, being a prophet is not necessarily the same thing as being a pastor. So that, that scripture that says, you know, would, would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, you know, prophets, basically a preacher, someone, and, you know, it's not talking about a position of a pastor. Again, this is the Old Testament. You didn't have that position back then. You had priests and, you know, the high priest and, and other priests and the Levites. And that came... They were chosen to do that, but it also had a, you know, a genealogy requirement. You had to be of the right tribe to even you know, hold that position, which is obviously different in the New Testament. So going to this passage to justify just starting your own church is ridiculous. It holds no water. Everything, I believe, in the Christian life should be get after its own kind. So if you're going to reproduce anything... It ought to come of the same kind. That's the natural way things happen. Just like with the animals, just like in Genesis chapter 1, God created the, the animals of the earth and the, and the trees and the plants and the herbs and everything else to, to reproduce after its own kind. And we use this in, in Christianity spiritually in um, the fact that you know someone who's saved begets another Christian, someone else who gets saved. You have to bring the word of God to other people. God has committed unto us the ministry of reconciliation. He's given us that job that a spirit-filled soul winner can go out and preach God's word so that other people can get saved. You're begetting someone after your own kind. And that's why the Apostle Paul says, you know, I have begotten thee. You know, son Timothy, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Son, you know, he, he's calling him his son because he has, in a, in a sense, given birth to him because he's the one who preached the gospel unto him and got him saved. Okay? He's reproducing spiritually in other people. Makes sense. You're going to bring forth after your own kind. Well, in the same sense, churches ought to be begetting other churches. That's why the, you know, within the church you're sending people out and ordaining people as, as the same way that I was within a church to be ordained. Someone, someone else, you know, the pastor of that church was able to look at me and, and be able to, to judge against these other requirements and say, is this person, you know, a novice? Is this person um, a brawler? Is he, you know, is he given to wine? And, and, and no, because I've been there for a long time and tried and tested and true and people can see whether or not I possess these requirements. I'm not saying within myself, I, I can do this, so I'm just going to go out and do it. It's not the way you start a biblical New Testament church. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. This is the cycle. This is the pattern. You have, you receive these, these orders, right? You receive, you receive these marching orders as Paul was given to Timothy. Again, Timothy was a pastor. He was an elder. He was a bishop. And he says, you need, you know, the things that you've heard of me, 
The teachings that you've learned of me, that I've passed on to you, now you need to take those and commit them unto faithful men. You need to teach other people that they can go out and teach others also. This is the reproduction that needs to happen of pastors being ordained to run churches. And I'll tell you what, there is so many things that you learn by being the, the understudy, by being someone who is under the authority of a pastor, someone else that's, that's there to help minister and to learn all the things that go on. You look at Elisha, right? He was the helper of Elijah before he ended up taking the mantle and, and, and going on and then continuing the ministry that Elijah was doing, but first he served before he got into a position where you could say he was a ruler or something like that. All the great men of God, they, they, they start off in humble beginnings. They learn and understand the, uh, you know, by being under someone else's authority and then coming on and being ordained to be in a position themselves. And you learn so much about the way a church ought to be run. You learn so much about how to handle different situations by being under someone who can teach you all of those things. Not just from hearing sermons on the internet, but actually being there. There are so many, there are countless things that I have learned by being a part of the church. I mean an actual member. Not viewing things online and just hearing sermons preach. I mean physically being there and witnessing all of the different events that happen, all the people that come and go, learning and getting to know other people within the church and seeing the way things play out and seeing infiltrators come in and seeing how everything is handled and administered firsthand from within a church gives you, the, the again, more of the, the tools that you need so that you are prepared and that you are no longer a novice and that you are able to run and administer things within the church. I understand there's a lot of people that are zealous, zealous to serve God. They want to do what's right. Hey, they've got this burning fire. I want to preach. I want to, I want to go out and do this stuff. Do it the right way. There are churches you could find, and it may not be the best church, but you can go and humble yourself and try to learn from someone else. I mean, there's got to be someone that's saved that can teach you that's a pastor somewhere in the area, if that's your desire to be sent out, if that's really what you want to do, and especially in this day and age, you can make it happen. If you really had a desire to do things the right way, maybe it means you have to put it off for a little while. Maybe it means, but look, if you have to do it the right way, why don't you do it the right way? Like, like King Saul. It seemed real pressing to him, but if he would have just waited a little, if he had just a little bit of patience, he could have done things the right way and God would have blessed him for it. But instead, God removed his office because he didn't do things God's way. So keep this in mind. If you, if you have a desire to become an elder, if you have a desire to, to, to hold the office of a bishop, do things the right way. Do things the Bible way. And, um, you know, I'm glad that, that I've learned so many of these truths by a man of God who, um, you know, who does know a lot of the Bible and that I was able to receive so much. But um, we all need to, to, to have a humble heart to be able to learn these things and before you can go out and just start teaching other people the same things. Let's bow our heads and have a, a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the instruction that you've given us in the Bible and, and how you have ordained for the, the New Testament churches to be run. I pray that you would please help us in this church to do things um, exactly the way that, that you would have us to do them, dear Lord, and that we wouldn't just ignore any of the, the, um, the order that you've, you've given to things, that we can run this church decently and in order and in a way that's pleasing to you, dear Lord, and that we wouldn't take things upon ourselves that ought, we ought not to take on ourselves as King Saul did, but um, just have the integrity and the honesty to do everything according to what's written in Scripture, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.